Okay, so this month we're going to talk about messaging with zero MQ, and uh, you might expect from the name of the library MQ that there is some kind of broker type situation in there. If you're familiar with a protocol called MQTT, this is a commonly used protocol for a lot of Internet of Things style sensors where you have sensors on the edge of your network gathering data. They send it to a broker. That's called a publish operation. And then the broker redistributes the message to subscribers that are connected to the broker. So the broker acts as a central server. Messages are sent from publishers and go to the broker. The broker redistributes them to subscribers. That's called a pub sub model. Uh, it's pretty common. But 0MQ, although it can be configured in such a topology, does not require any central server. So 0MQ, hence the 0, the idea is you can have a 0 broker solution, uh, a traditional client-server relationship where the two applications, one designated the client, the other designated the server, are talking to each other over some kind of communication channel, and they're sending messages back and forth. So, um, let's take a look at that. Um, if we go to the 0MQ website, which is just uh, 0MQ.org, if we go just to their main website, I'll just make that font a little bigger. Um, they explain all that in here. 0MQ looks like an embeddable networking library, but acts like a concurrency framework. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. It gives you sockets. Yes? Sorry, are you trying to show something? All I'm seeing is your little... Um, icon thing. If you... if Well, I see it on my view in Jitsi. If you click on my icon, that should place my screen in the center. I mean, I'm sharing my screen. It's alright. Jitsi can be confusing, so. Um, so they, they're saying that it looks like an embeddable networking library, but acts like a concurrency framework. And we'll explain what that means in a little bit. Uh, it gives you sockets that carry atomic messages across various transports like in process, inter process, TCP, and multicast. And you can connect sockets with various patterns like end-to-end, -end, fan out, pub sub, that's the one we just mentioned that is dominant in MQTT style applications, uh, task distribution and request reply. Now, um, what I found really interesting about 0MQ is that they refer to the connection between entities that are sending messages as a socket. But if you're used to sockets from Berkeley sockets, it's both, um, it, it can be a little bit confusing because the, the sockets in, M, in 0MQ are much more capable than Berkeley sockets, uh, BSD sockets. Berkeley Standard Distribution was the Unix that created the concept of sockets as network connections that look like file descriptors. So, how do 0MQ sockets differ from Berkeley sockets? Well, Berkeley sockets, while they can be used um, in process, meaning you could have, like, say, two different executing threads communicating via a socket, it would be kind of weird because you don't normally use a socket that way. Uh, you it, you could use a socket that way, right? You could have a process start listening for messages on a socket on one thread, and then you can have another thread that connects to that socket and start sending messages to it. But that's kind of weird because normally you wouldn't use sockets that way um, because what you would be doing in that case is on the thread that is sending messages, the um, 
the stuff would the, the the data would go through essentially the entire network stack even though there's not really any networking involved you're communicating between two threads in the same process normally you would do that with say a piece of shared memory or you would just um, use some other mechanism you wouldn't use a socket per se but in zero MQ a socket although it's called a socket it doesn't necessarily have to mean transport across the network it's really just a communication channel for sending messages you can think of it uh, if you're familiar with communicating sequential processes from Tony Hoare this is an early 1970s concept for addressing concurrency where the concurrency could be two threads in a process it could be two, two processes on the same machine it could be two processes on different machines separated by a network um, communicating sequential processes doesn't care it just establishes a communication channel between two entities and messages are sent on that channel and um, you only get a whole message you never get half a message so uh, unlike say Berkeley sockets it's it's entirely possible that the intervening network fabric could take your large message chop it up into a bunch of smaller messages and distribute those across the network they, they can even take different paths and then you have to assemble your large message from those fragments now TCP transmission control protocol will do that fragmenting for you and the reassembly for you so it's not necessarily an application responsibility but if you use UDP sockets that's user datagram protocol then it is up to you to make sure that you know all the pieces of the message arrive in the right order and that you reassemble them correctly and, and UDP doesn't even guarantee delivery so the sender may send you UDP messages and the intervening network may drop them due to errors or whatnot and uh, it's up to you when you use UDP it's up to the application to detect that uh, packets frames however you want to call it messages that they've been missed and and request retransmission from the sender that is what TCP does for you on top of UDP but that's all kind of overhead and overkill for sending messages between threads within a single process so you could think of 0MQ really as a way to establish communication channels between two communicating entities and send messages reliably between them now um, 0MQ has a lot of features we're gonna look just at a very simple response request style example continuing with our little comic book database example that we've been using for these um, network libraries we're going to show a simple implementation of uh, you know enough of a crud create read update delete style database networked application that you can see how it works I didn't didn't implement every single one of the create read update delete operations because after you implement like a couple of them they're all pretty much the same and this it, you know it's not implementing the additional uh, verbs so to speak does not yield any additional insight but it does show you how uh, zero MQ can be used as a remote procedure call style networking topology uh, and they refer to that here as the request reply connection between sockets um, now I mentioned that zero MQ sockets do more than Berkeley sockets what is the more that they do well unlike um, Berkeley sockets there is um, the ability for zero MQ sockets to reconnect after the connection has been broken and then gets reestablished so say your server crashes in the middle of a client talking to it zero MQ can uh, recognize that the client disappeared or sorry that the server disappeared and then it starts buffering messages requests internally until the server comes back online then 0MQ reconnects to the server and then re 
and then continues sending the buffered requests. Now, if you're doing a kind of request reply, reply, sorry, request reply style communication mechanism, um, it's it's a little bit different in that you know you send the request, and if the request gets dropped, your client is kind of blocked waiting for the reply and the reply is never going to come once the server comes back online because it crashed in the middle of processing the request but for these other topologies like pub sub uh, fan out task distribution and so on where you're doing things more asynchronously instead of synchronously then um, that's a more realistic scenario for 0MQ restarting after the service comes back online. So for instance, if it's a pub sub scenario and you're a subscriber and the thing that's publishing the messages crashes but then gets restarted, once it gets restarted, you're going to start receiving the messages again without you having to do anything particularly special. You're just like, you know, when messages come in, let me know. Uh, so your code wouldn't have to deal with that error scenario. It'd be handled by 0MQ. Um, and as we'll see, uh, there's the ability to configure 0MQ with a broker style server in the center to uh, increase reliability. Um, that broker basically acts as a relay point between, um, you know, say worker nodes that are doing work at the request of clients and clients that are trying to get work done. But as you scale out your worker nodes, you don't want to have to go and reconfigure all your clients in order to have them recognize the new workers. So you put a piece of infrastructure in the middle that ends as a well, acts as a well-known connecting point for clients. They connect to the well-known point, and then that uh, piece of centralized infrastructure distributes the work to all the workers and gathers all the results back and sends forwards it on back on to the clients. So that's essentially acting as a broker for a distributed work queue, but um, it has the advantage that you can add and remove workers, you can scale out the, the, the worker nodes as far as you want, and you don't have to reconfigure any of the clients. They don't have to be adjusted. They can keep connecting to the same centralized place. So. Um, 0MQ as a library has been around for quite a while, like I think 15 or 17 years, something like that. Um, it has, being a very mature library and being widely used, it has really good documentation. And um, the best part of their documentation is this thing called the guide. And um, so this guide, it's basically a book. Uh, it, it's quite lengthy. Um, I've read through it all, and I would say the part that you need to know in order to use uh, 0MQ in, in your uh, typical basic scenario would be like these first couple of chapters, uh, basics, sockets, and patterns. And then as you get more sophisticated in how you want to establish your infrastructure for messaging, then these advanced patterns, uh, some of these more advanced ones are, are useful to consult because they describe how to do things like um, change your architecture to introduce more fault tolerance into your end-to-end -end solution so that can be a big problem with network oriented services right is how do you deal with load how do you deal with reliability because now it you know you know they they say the the power of the network is only as strong as its weakest link so if you have your application depending on network services you want to make sure that the network is the the, the network service is not the weakest link um so if we take a look at the basics here, uh, I'm not going to read through all of this. I'm just going to show you some of the diagrams and we'll talk about uh, some of these network topologies. So this is the one that we're going to use in our basic CRUD style application that we've got a client that issues requests. 
to some server and it uses a, a request socket type from ZMQ to send a message. It, re it receives a response from the server over that socket. Uh, the socket type on the server end is a reply socket. So the request company, it's a single socket, but the client has a request type socket and the server has a reply type socket. Uh, we'll see how that changes the code um, when we look at the specific example. Um, but it is not necessary. Uh, oh, and the messages are just um, the message that are, messages that are sent back and forth between these sockets are uninterpreted by zero MQ. As far as zero MQ is concerned, it's just a count and an array of bytes. So that's kind of what they're showing down here in this diagram that a frame is just a count and a and a number of bytes following that. And they have little um, utility routines for interpreting that array of bytes as a string, for instance. We, we will see that. Now, here's an example of a pub sub style architecture where the publisher has a, a, a socket of type pub and it sends updates to subscribers that have connected to the publisher and the subscribers use a a, a sub type talk socket. Um, there's a couple more uh, socket types that you can see here. There's a push-pull uh, style um, or there's a push-pull set of socket types and you can find as you read through this the, the first two chapters of this guide you, you know you can see when you would use a push pull and when you would use a pub sub and it has to do with the amount of um, the amount of asynchronousness so um, when you use a if we go back up here if you use a request reply pair of sockets that the client sends a request and then the client is expected to read the reply back from the server. So it's a kind of do this, then that. You know, the, the, you always have those messages going in pairs. Where if it's a, uh, a pub sub style model, I mean, the client may connect after the publisher has already published a bunch of messages. Obviously, if it connects after messages have been published, it can't read those because they were transmitted over the network before the, the subscriber connected. But um, afterwards, these uh, after the subscriber has connected, it's going to start seeing messages from the, publer, from the publisher. Now, that's a little bit different from the MQTT style broker-oriented pub-sub model, where in MQTT, there is a mechanism by which you can have that centralized broker remember the most recently published message and whenever a client connects it will get that message first. You can implement that manually in 0MQ if you want but 0MQ doesn't impose such things. In other words 0MQ is kind of more mechanism than policy whereas MQTT is a protocol that specifies policy for pub sub style messaging. Um, so uh, there's this push-pull pair that can be used to um, when you when you push a message when you use a push type socket to send a message it is distributed to one and only one of the pull sockets that are connected to the push socket so this is oriented for uh, distributed work queues, right? You don't want to send the same work item to multiple workers. You want to send it to a single worker. Uh, and there's obviously some scheduling algorithm that determines which worker is selected when the push socket has a message to send, but it will send it to only one of the workers. And then the workers will use a push socket to send the uh, results down to us you can have a single pull connected to the push from the worker 
So the worker has a pull socket that it uses to re receive work. It has a push socket that it uses to send the results. And if you connect a single uh, sink to all of the workers, then there, you know there's only one to send it to when they go to send their message on their push socket. So it aggregates all the results down into the sink. Um, here's they're discussing you know the the queuing mechanism that they use so that when uh, you know multiple push sockets are sending messages, how do they end up going down into the the pool that is the sink? Um, we will look at the C++ API binding. That's just a thin header only binding on top of the C API that is the core libzmq. Um, but basically there is a context that you have to establish and then there are data types uh, in and C. They're just uh, represented as opaque void stars. So you create, you have a call a create function in the C API to create one of these objects. You call a destroy function when you no longer need the object. And these are things like messages and sockets. And those are all created relative to some context. Typically the context is one to one with a process. But depending on your application architecture, it may be one to one with a thread. Um, either architectural choice can be valid depending on what you're trying to do, depending on you know how your application is structured. But um, you do need to make sure that you know all the communication that's happening between sockets that are created from a context happens relative to that context. So that's why it's typically that you would have a single context for the entire process. Um, little history of why they created 0MQ. Um, again, I'm not going to read through all of this, but if we go, that was the basics, and if we go look over here at um, Let's go down a little further. So they have uh, built-in communication patterns in the core zero MQ. These are request reply. This is the the pattern that we will use in our example, and that's because we're doing like a, a basic remote procedure call style uh, pattern. Um, it, it's easy because it's just there's a single socket on each end and um, the code's pretty straightforward. It's not that it's hard to do any of these other patterns, but it's just more work. And there are plenty of examples. You might have seen me skipping over a little bit of it. There are plenty of examples in this guide. Let's scroll down here. So here's multiple socket reader in C, but the example is available for C++, C Sharp, uh, CL. What is C? Is that Common Lisp? Yes, Common Lisp. Delphi, Erlang, Elixir, F Sharp, Felix. I don't know what Felix is. Might be a f some kind of functional programming language or a variant of JavaScript, maybe. Uh, but you can see uh, all these different exam all these different uh, languages where they have um, converted the code. Looks like maybe they don't have a version in Node.js. But it is interesting that there is an a zero MQ binding for Node.js because um, you wouldn't expect that, but there is. Uh, the examples that we will be looking at are in C++. So um, they're using a little helper header. You can see, you know, here's some code. We'll, we'll, we'll look at, um, I've got their basic hello world example coded up and running in Visual Studio. We will look at that. But as you're browsing through this documentation and you want to see their examples, you just expand any of these little uh, triple, like it's not a triple chevron, it's just a triangle. Just expand this little triangle to bring the code down and select a particular uh, language that you want to see it in. There is support for multi-part messages where it's just a convenient way for you to carve up chunks of a message so, for instance, in 
um, typical remote procedure call, you might transmit some metadata about the operation you want to perform and then transmit the payload that is the data. So you've got a metadata part and the data part. And you can do that by just saying when you send a message on the socket there's a flag that says I've got more data to come and then the last piece has um, the flag indicating that it's the last piece. Now what's interesting about the um, communication topology patterns that are supported in 0MQ is that sometimes they use this multi-part message structure to be able to tack on routing information to messages so that um, it can be used by the 0MQ infrastructure to do the right thing with the message. Um, so it, 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 it might be the case that even though you didn't send a multi-part message because you had some transparent uh, 0MQ infrastructure in the middle like say one of these brokers that acts as a central collecting point it might tack on another part to the message send it to a worker and then when the worker sends the response back it has that tacked on piece that lets the centralized component know oh this was the client it can pull that piece off and it identifies the client that made the request into the worker farm so the worker nodes become ignorant of who made the request uh, but they extract out the payload and when they send the response back they just uh, add back on the the metadata that they stripped off that tells the centralized broker which client made the request so it, it knows where to send the result back uh, that's again all described in detail in here uh, in the guide um, this pub sub that we talked about here's this example of where you have this uh, abstracting proxy in the middle all the subscribers connect to this piece of infrastructure in the middle that acts as a proxy and then it's the proxy that is getting aggregating results from multiple publishers so that your subscribers are connecting to a well-known point and as publishers come and go the subscribers don't care um, same thing and that and that's done with this special X sub and X pub socket type pair extended pub sub um, similarly you can have um, multiple services acting as um, workers for a single client the client sends a request and it'll be distributed to one of these reply sockets and then the reply sockets will send the response back uh, so this this is an example of something you wouldn't get with Berkeley sockets right in Berkeley sockets you would have to do all this uh, queuing and um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, scheduling of messages to the different services and you'd have to keep track of these services coming and going and you'd have to you know have all that logic inside your application to notice when servers come and go to add them to your scheduling algorithm so that the workload is distributed properly between them it kind of just all comes for free with 0MQ so that's um, nice that 0MQ is kind of giving us things for free so that we don't have to worry about this stuff. Getting that stuff right, especially in terms of all the uh, error handling as things come and go, that is non-trivial code. And it can be a long-term source of bugs if you're trying to do that yourself. You can just use 0MQ and get that um, experience for you out of the box. You don't have to learn it the hard way. Uh, similarly, there's this thing called the router dealer. Uh, this is um, similar to what I was showing earlier with the pub sub where you have that proxy in the middle. This is a proxy in the middle for uh, request reply style remote RPC. 
So this router is accepting connections from multiple request sockets and the dealer sends the um, requests to in, in an even uh, scheduling fashion out to one of these reply sockets and uh, the communication goes back. Uh, so it acts as a centralizing uh, abstraction for however many services you have running and however many clients you have running it it it, it acts as kind of I don't want, I hesitate to say load balancer because that's not really the right terminology but um, it will you know allow your clients to connect to a central location and then it will distribute the work to a number of services that can reply th with the, the response um, and then you can have situations where you use one of these proxies as a way to bridge a firewall between internal um, workers you know because it, it say you're providing a service across the internet but you have to access internal resources well those internal resources are located inside the internal network and the clients are located outside the internal network so you have to have some way of bridging uh, uh, between the internal and external network and you can do that using um, the socket types in 0MQ. So um, I don't think there's uh, a whole lot I mean there's just more network patterns in here in this guide again if you want to dig into this library I would recommend uh, reading these first two uh, chapters at least. Um, there's some discussion here about multi-threading and that basically comes down to how are you going to be using the sockets and the context uh, between threads and the general uh, the general advice that's, su that's sufficient for most people is to have a single context and have the different threads create their own their own sockets. So that comes back to one of the things I mentioned earlier that's different about 0MQ sockets versus Berkeley sockets is that it's entirely reasonable to have two different threads each create uh, their own sockets to use to communicate to each other and you use that um, when we uh, look at the code here actually maybe they have a here's a multi-threaded relay in C++ so they create a context, create a, uh, a socket that's uh, ZMQ pair type. They bind it to this uh, in proc style uh, scheme that indicates we're going to use messaging between two entities within the same process. They create a thread. Uh, that's going to uh, this thread calls step two as the thread start function it gets the context that was created for the process from the uh, thread routine argument it creates a receiver socket it binds that receiver socket it creates another thread that does step one and passing on the context as the thread routine argument and that thread gets the shared context creates a sender socket connects to in proc step 2 it sends a message on that socket so step 2 cr created a receiver where it was bound to in proc step 2 it launched step 1 that's going to send a message step 2 is waiting to receive a message on the receiver socket that it created and notice that we're not connecting these two threads from the address of this socket type but through the binding of the locally created sockets in each thread to an identifier that establishes the communication channel between the two threads so this in proc step 2 here it's a, a ZMQ pair type so it can um, be bound or you know well this guy's doing the bind because he's going to receive messages this guy's doing a connect because he's going to send messages so it, 
send a message to that socket that it connected to this guy is bound to that identifier so he's listening for connections to receive messages receives the message from the other thread then he can bind to the step three by doing a connect so he's gonna by doing connect he's gonna configure that socket for sending messages he sends to step three step three was what the main thread was bound to so it receives a message on step three so what happened here is the main thread created a socket bound to the step three identifier launched a thread and it's waiting for a message on this step three binding that won't this this will block until the message arrives the message will arrives by um, this step two sending it after it has received a message from the the socket that it created to do step one step one will do the do some amount of work and then send a message so they're using messages on these zero MQ sockets here as a way of coordinating the behavior of parallel threats so that's an example of how really these sockets in zero MQ they represent communication channels between two communicating entities and those entities can be two threads within the single process as this example shows they can be two processes on the same machine so in that case there's no networking involved the communication happens over uh, you know could happen over a shared memory segment that is opened by both of the processes um, it could happen locally over a socket connection as well I mean there's nothing wrong with two processes communicating on the same machine over a socket but it might not be the fastest way for them to communicate due to all the networking protocol overhead that you're tossing in there when they could have just used a shared memory segment that was opened by both of the processes um, you could do either one in 0MQ depending on these identifiers that you use to connect and bind the sockets to and you know they're just strings so they could be coming out of a configuration file so you can use a 0MQ architecture and start with something that say two threads in a process and then you decide that now these things need to be two processes on the same machine the code doesn't really have to change all that changes is the connect and bind identifiers that are used to establish the ends of the communication channel then those two processes on the same machine might need to be two processes running on different machines and again all that's changing in your code is the connect and bind identifiers that you're using to establish the ends of these communication channels and as you make the two entities that are communicating on this channel get farther and farther apart ZMQ adds more facilities for um, buffering and error handling between the two ends of the channel as is appropriate for the type of communication that's been requested so obviously there's not going to be um, if it's in proc style communication channel there's not as much stuff to worry about like you know the server goes away I have to reconnect and all that all that logic can be dispensed with because it's just not relevant it, the only way the in proc communication channel can go away is if your thread crashed or the entire process crashed if the entire process crashes then you know all the threads are gone so it's not gonna matter and if an individual thread crashes that usually brings down the whole process anyway because um, you normally don't have any kind of error recovery from a thread crashing usually an individual thread crashing is just as serious as if the entire process crashed it's conceivable that you could wrap something around a thread crashing and restart the thread to handle more messages but that would you know that's kind of like catching null pointer dereferences and just starting the work all over again Ch likelihood is that you're going to just have another null pointer dereference and get stuck in an infinite error handling loop but this is just an example of how
zero MQ could be used to establish communication channels between two uh, multiple threads within a single process as opposed to network communication. So really the right way to think of zero MQ is as a mechanism for establishing communication channels between two entities. Those two entities could be threads within a process, multiple processes on the same machine, or they could be processes on different machines. So um, again, uh, there's a lot of information in this guide. I've just, you know, we've kind of skimmed over the first uh, two chapters here. Um, they have a little uh, problem solver flow chart here, things to, to do based on lots of people you, having experience with zero MQ and experiencing some sort of problem. Now, I will say that in my uh, effort to make a CRUD style uh, RPC client server pair, I didn't need to consult this. Um, it, it was really straightforward to set up basic communication. Uh, I think more often you get into this flowchart if you have advanced topologies or or possibly it can be easier to get into needing this flowchart if you're using the C API. The C++ API makes sure that object lifetimes are appropriate and so on. Uh, the you know the little constructor function is called in the constructor of the C++ wrapper and the little destroy function is called in the destructor of the wrapper so it, it's just pretty straightforward in terms of using the objects um, okay so let's take a look at some code here um, let me bring this over okay so I've got this little comic book database that we've been using before. Um, it has the ability to marshal a comic structure in and out of JSON. And our structure has, you know, the title of the comic, the issue number, and then um, a little shared pointer wrapped around a string to represent the individual uh, credits for a particular comic. Um, and our database is just a vector of these structures, so it's it, it, in terms of the in-memory representation, but the, these are details that are not necessarily significant for this example. It's just the simple way to have a database. Um, the simple, let's look at just a little kind of hello world ZMQ client and server pair. So this is the client and as I mentioned there is a ZMQ context. I'm using these little C++ wrappers. So if you can see inside here that all the little wrapper does is call the C API function and manage that pointer inside a little wrapper class. It, the C++ API uses exceptions for error handling. The C API uses Erno style uh, error handling, so return codes. So I've got my context, this little two here. Um, the context does everything uh, every everything in zero MQ is essentially asynchronous operating on a thread pool so that's another thing that zero MQ is giving you for free compared to Berkeley sockets In Berkeley sockets you would have had to uh, manage the asynchronous nature of the network IO yourself by using select on the file descriptors to see if there's any waiting IO pending the file descriptors representing the open sockets and you have to then figure out how to assign any pending IO to the threads that you've got in a thread pool based on you know how many compute resources you have available to you and so on. ZMQ handles all that automatically but we can give it a suggestion as to how many threads it should use for IO so in this case I've just used two uh, if you if you don't supply a value I'm using this uh, version of the constructor here that's you know two IO threads 
um, and it just passes that down as a configuration parameter on the context uh, the number of IO threads and the number of Mac sockets um, the guide explains how um, I, I believe between the previous major version of 0MQ and the current major version the number of threads that was chosen was different um, so you can find that information in the guide if you care all the all the examples that I've seen they just kind of put a number in there to make it explicit so it works with either uh, either major version of 0MQ so I'm just using two threat two IO threads I'm gonna create a request socket type I'm going to connect that to localhost port 5555 using TCP and I'm going to send a message uh, I, I this uh, send method here on the socket is overloaded for a couple of convenient uh, data types in the C++ API there's this const buffer which is what I'm using but uh, more ab more abstractly there's a message T type that represents messages um, and this uh, flags business is how you uh, we talked about multi-part messages that it's the flags that determine you know if you've got more parts to append to the message before the message is complete in this case I'm just sending a simple string hello world and as we saw before in the guide that you know really 0MQ doesn't have any interpretation of strings it's just a byte buffer with a count so the little uh, stir buffer thing there helps turn a constant string into a count followed by the bytes of data that represent the string it does the bytes of data do not include the null byte you don't need the null byte since you have the count um, little flags here is we're not gonna we're not gonna wait we're just gonna do the send we're not gonna wait for the receiver to receive the message after we send it so the send call basically queues up work and returns immediately then we will uh, receive the reply that's obviously going to block until the other end has given us the response to the message that we sent and the corresponding server code is pretty similar except since this is a server the whole thing is in a in a forever loop there's a uh, explanation in the guide of how you can enhance this to you know ha um, you know you can obviously implement your own shutdown command that you receive as a request and then you can exit the loop on the shutdown command there's also some discussion in the guide of how to uh, introduce some more uh, reliability here and error handling and make this uh, a little more reliable um, there's discussion in the guide of how to architect your communication topology so that for instance in I mentioned when you have like a pub sub topology the subscriber might connect after some of the messages have been sent some of the messages have been published in which case the subscriber would have missed some messages uh, similar to the way MQTT has like a broker with a you know last message state you can implement similar patterns in 0MQ and those are described in the advanced chapters of the guide how to uh, guarantee that uh, subscribers don't miss messages and so on it's it's not particularly difficult it just is a matter of adding a little bit of more policy into the servers it's usually the servers that need the additional logic not the clients um, but uh, sometimes you know depending on what you're trying to do you might want to have the clients be a little bit more robust uh, in, in paying attention to when servers disappear and so on so uh, back to this example you notice in the <coughs> in the client it did a connect on the socket and it specified a specific uh, host here I used local host and um, <coughs> excuse me on the server we are doing a bind 
uh, we're binding on the same port number, but instead of localhost, it specified asterisk here. And I believe that what that gets you is you can listen to that port on any of the network interfaces that are in the host. So you may have multiple network interfaces um, in, I think in TCP IP, you might, if you want to listen to multiple network interfaces uh, or bind, you might have to create a binding for each one. Um, so if you have a server with multiple network cards in it and you want to listen for connections on all of those cards, I think uh, I'm not an expert in networking, but I believe you have to, at the Berkeley socket level, you would have to um, bind on each of those interfaces, each of those Ethernet interfaces uh, to establish um, that you're listening on all of them because each Ethernet interface has a different IP address, even though they're all in the same host. Um, if you were, if this was localhost instead of star, then as long as the client was also on localhost, it would connect reg regardless of how many network interfaces I had. But if the, you know, if the client and the server are on different machines and the server machine has multiple network interfaces, the server would need to bind on all of the network interfaces to allow clients on any one of those networks to connect to the service. At any rate, um, server does a bind, uh, creates a, a message, waits on the socket to receive a message, does some work, in this case it's just sleeping for one second, and then builds a reply. Uh, the C++ wrapper for their message type this is the number of bytes that are in the buffer of the message. And uh, using this uh, data accessor, we get a void star pointer to the beginning of the buffer. We're going to copy the five bytes from this string. This is a uh, null terminated string, but we're not copying the null. We're just copying the bytes. Since it already has a count, we don't need to include the null byte. And then we'll send that reply on the socket and then continue back and do this forever. So I've built both of these. So I've got over here the ZMQ client and the ZMQ service. So let me run the service in Visual Studio. And we'll bring that window over here. And I can run the client over here. And you can see that it was awaiting a request. It received a hello request. And then I went back to waiting for more requests. This guy connected to the server. It sent a request. It awaited the reply. And it got the reply world. <coughs> okay, so, excuse me. <coughs> so that's pretty uh, straightforward for the simple hello world. What does it look like for our comics database? Well, let's look at the client. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you know, sometimes you just get something tickle in your throat. Okay, so um, here's our client. Create a context. Create a socket. It's a request type socket. And it's going to connect to, at this time, I've just switched it to port 8080. And it's going to connect on local host. And we're going to send two requests, uh, a load request and a create comic request. I'm sending my request payload as JSON. Now, ZeroMQ doesn't know anything about JSON. Uh, Bruce W in the chat says TCP does allow specifying any to the bind to listen to all network interfaces. Okay, that's good to know. I am, as I said, I'm not a TCP IP networking expert. Um, I would imagine the star then is probably just translating to the any 
to bind to any and all network interfaces. Uh, so in my in my main code down here, I'm calling load. So this is the first request that's going to come from my client. Now, I could have you know wrote some kind of interactive you know console app doohickey thing, but I just coded up to uh, requests straight coming from this client. It, whenever you run this client, it's always going to do these two requests. Uh, it it demonstrates it sufficiently that you can see what's going on. So the load request. What I'm going to do on the socket is I'm going to send uh, this message that I get from load request and then I'm going to receive the reply on the socket and then I'm just going to print out whatever came back uh, from the reply as string. So this is part of the C++ wrapper, this two string member function. And if you drill into it, all it does is it says, hey, um, get the data pointer, which is a void star cast that to a const care star, get the size of the data buffer, and pass that to the std string constructor that takes a pointer and a size and build a string out of that. So that's just gives us a convenient way of getting the string out of a message, or, or rather treating the message's payload as a sequence of printable characters with a count. You know, so it, remember, there's no null byte, so we can't just take the data pointer and cast it to care star. We can't. That may work. You may luck out that after your payload in the message might be a null byte, but you can't rely on that. You have to use the size of the payload. So what are we going to send with this load request? Well, we're going to make a uh, JSON document. I'm using rapid JSON here, but you could use any um any encoding that you want i mean this could be a building the buffer with as a cap and proto message which you can look at our presentation from september on that uh that we go into all the details of cap and proto and how to do uh, uh serialization with cap and proto but here we're just going to use json and so we're gonna the the json document will have an object at the top level and the object will have a key called request that will have a value called load and then we're going to serialize that JSON into a string and then we're going to build our ZMQ message from that string so this message T takes or it has a I think it, where is it it's a uh, It's this guy, I think, is the one we're using that builds a message from a std string. Let's double check that theory. Uh, let's go back here, and this thing. Uh, oh, it's building it from a, a null terminated care star, so. It's not smart enough. Oh, I bet. Okay, so this is a care star. And then they use the implicit conversion from care star to std string, and then we build the buffer or the message rather from std string. So that gets our message. That's what we send over the socket. We get a reply and we just print out whatever the reply came back. For the next request that we do, we create a comic. This code is basically the same. The only thing that's different is the message we're creating for the create request so I build one of these comic data structures and this get kind of goofy where I take I take this data structure here I already had a function from our previous working with this little database that would convert my little application specific structure would convert that to JSON and then you know it's not the most performant thing to do but I just take the JSON and parse it that I got from my little application serializer it knows how to serialize that into JSON so I have a JSON string and then I just parsed it again so that I could stick the parsed object as a sub object of the request so the request is an object where the request key is this time it's create instead of load uh, 
and then there's an additional key called comic that is that parsed object that I got back out now if I were doing this not just for example purposes but in a real application I would probably have an overload of this to or, you know or some kind of other version of this serializer function because this serializer function it's building a rapid JSON object and then it serializes that JSON object into a string so I'm taking my application specific data structure turning it into a JSON object taking that JSON object turning it into a string and then I'm parsing it back into a JSON object all over again here so if I were doing this for real I would skip that unnecessary to and from string business in the middle and I, I'd have a way to you know maybe I'd have a function that instead of two JSON I'd have one as like two JSON object that returned a rapid JSON object that I could just stick right in here without having to reparse the string again but this was the most expedient way to get this done so again just serializing this request object JSON object into a string and then putting that into the message that I sent over on the server side similar thing happens I've got my main loop here where I'm receiving requests I'm gonna call this process request function that's going to take the request message and I've got my uh, it's essentially a global but it's a local inside main right so its lifetime is equivalent to the lifetime of the process that's my comic book database it's initially empty and I'm passing that to this little process request function I'm assuming that my requests come in as a JSON object so the first thing I do is parse the string from the message into a JSON object I get the request key out of that JSON object and if it's load I call this little load function if it's create I call this little create comic function so this is uh, the place where I take the network payload and decide what kind of RPC remote procedure call operation is being requested of my service now when we did rest API's this was handled by different uh, URL endpoints and we use some kind of a URL router to map those endpoints onto the application functions that correspond to this load function or the create comic function that I've written here um, if you take a look at load it just loads the database this was a a function we had in all our previous networking examples that just loads a couple of you know pieces of fixed data into this little um, I calling it a database but really it's just a, a vector of structs and then I have to build the response so that's in uh, the response is a JSON object so uh, the response that I build is an object with an IDs key and that IDs key gives an array of numbers where those numbers represent valid IDs for comics that I could request from the database so I didn't implement the read operation but the read operation would accept an ID and if uh, the ID wasn't in that set of valid IDs it would you know give an error but otherwise it would read use that ID as an index into the vector of structures and then read out the comic at that the comic data structure at that index it would take that comic structure serialize it into JSON as the response um, so this business here is just building the JSON response from the load operation this is the, the doing the actual load again take that JSON object serialize it into a string use the uh, pointer and size constructor of message T to return a message for load for create comic it's a little bit different now I have uh, a payload that I have to parse out of the JSON document that represents the request so I pull out the object that's in the comic uh, key 
and then within that object there's a bunch of keys that represent the individual pieces of the data that represents um, the comic that is going to be created so this is the in the crud it stands for create read update delete the four basic database operations this is the create operation so I have a application logic that creates a comic and adds it to the database I build my application structure locally call that create comic function I have to build the JSON response <coughs> excuse me which is just the ID of the newly inserted comic <coughs> <coughs> All right, so pretty straightforward stuff. If we run the server in Visual Studio, so let's run that. So here it's waiting for requests. We go back over here and run Comics Client. And you can see that it sent a load request. The response it got back was that the database is loaded with two comics that have IDs 0 and 1 and <coughs> excuse me we sent a create request <coughs> I should have had a glass of water on hand All right. sent the create request and then we got back the response that the newly created comic is at ID 2 Okay, so that's basically <coughs> the remote procedure call style for using 0MQ. <coughs> Do we have any questions? <coughs> So as I mentioned, the guide goes over a lot more scenarios for network topologies. <coughs> and uh, if you're interested in those more advanced scenarios, I would recommend consulting that guide. It's very, <coughs> excuse me, very detailed. <coughs> it's very complete. Uh, it's very well written. It's been refined over a number of years from many contributions from the community of people using 0MQ. This library is widely used. It's got a lot of different language bindings. It's all open source. I believe they're using the Mozilla public license, which is a commercially friendly license, if I remember correctly, kind of similar to MIT license. Um, the GitHub repo has all the source code. Um, you know, if we drill into the header files, there's not so much like inline documentation, you know, uh, Doxygen style in the header files, but the, <coughs> at least not in the C++ ones, let's look at the, the C header. Yeah, there's some block comments in here explaining various things. Uh, really, the guide um, covers a lot of the scenarios where you might need to use these extra functions and uh, <coughs> the different socket types and how you would configure them. Um, honestly, when I was writing my little... Uh, service and client here let's so put them both side by side I didn't need to consult the documentation I mean I, I looked at the documentation to copy this basic hello world client and uh, once I had that um, it wasn't hard to you know modify that I mean all I really did was change the 
way the messages are built and the port I just changed it from 5555 to 8080 um, it's really one of those libraries where they've worked very hard to make it so that all the difficult stuff is on the inside of the library and not on the outside so all of the sophisticated buffering and queuing and you know um, message assignment distribution algorithms and stuff that's all on the inside so their whole uh, goal as they state in the guide was to take all this complex networking stuff and hide that inside a library that most of the time out of the box does exactly what you want and if you need to tweak it to do something slightly different that is also possible so there's we saw when we looked at what happens when we pass this number of threads to this context constructor that it may set some attributes on the context there are also ways to configure sockets with particular attributes so that you can opt out of the default behavior and apply specific behavior for specific needs so it really goes a long way towards simplifying communication patterns between multiple entities and that's why they refer to it as a concurrency framework hiding inside a networking library um, overall it was a very um, pleasant experience trying this library out I didn't find I got confused or stuck um, if I had to drill into their header files it was readable maybe didn't have comments on everything but if it's readable enough I don't I don't need comments to explain it to me if the code is straightforward enough and they have good layering so the C++ layer sitting on top of the C API the C API is well thought out enough that really the C++ layer is just a thin wrapper so um, very easy to get up and get going um, if there's any questions we'll take that and otherwise we'll wrap it up hello Richard hi Bruce Wick. Bruce Williams here hi uh, thanks for finding this this is a quite an interesting little library it's good fun so thanks for sharing that with us it, it's one that has been talked about a lot uh, which is why it was on my list of topics to go over and um, I was expecting it to be an MQTT style broker library and I was surprised to find out what was actually inside so uh -huh. yeah quite a bit I'm definitely going to give it a try um, forgive me if this was answered the first part I had trouble with the uh, app didn't have any audio so I finally had to switch to the web and messed up with five minutes or so but um, is this uh, a very good for like a mobile environment <laughs> Um, I get the impression that this thing is used everywhere uh, mobile desktop server farm everywhere Good. That's the kind of thing you love. Uh, you they recreate everything when you change platforms it yeah it is it has a Java binding so you know would easily fit into Android uh, I think over here they had Uh, I think there's an Objective C binding, but all of the examples haven't been ported to Ob Objective C. I mean, obviously, Objective C can call things from C, so it could call the C API. Um, sure. But uh, th this Zero MQ has been around for, like I said, I think at least 15 years, and it's been widely used in a bunch of different environments and. Um, I would not be surprised at all if people are using it in mobile apps. That's good. I've, I've done a lot of uh, rolling my own of communications uh, over the years, having worked with a lot of uh, specialized devices and things. But if this is truly portable, it would be nice to bring in something that I could then port from platform to platform without having to recreate the wheel. Uh, it's definitely... Um, oh, let's just go back here to the main site open source universal messaging uh, used by a bunch of 
people and is, you know connect to your code in any language on any platform that's a strong claim sure. so my I think on by any platform they mean anything that is Windows sockets or BSD sockets and all the mobile platforms being kind of Unix derived now that Windows phones no longer a thing they're all going to be using BSD style sockets so uh, uh -huh. if when you get into the guide there are some very small limitations on Windows because there's certain features that they either they haven't you know it wasn't a straight delegation to Winsock to do the corresponding thing because it, 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 the feature is uh, such that it's kind of Unix oriented Well, also Zero MQ is doing a bunch of things besides just the socket API layer, right? So some of these things, like um, I think it came down to things like uh, communication between two processes on the same machine didn't quite have the same finesse as it did on Linux, and it, it, I don't know that it's necessarily a shortcoming of Windows. It's just that it, they haven't implemented it. But those exceptions are called out in the guide, and there's there's very few of them. Okay. Did, did it have um, both uh, datagram oriented and function oriented codes? Yes, you can. Uh, as we saw in our example code here, uh, we were doing TCP, but you could do UDP, or you can do broadcast. So zero MQ also supports um, what's called in networking protocol terms is called multicast. So if if you're multicast, yeah. yeah if you're if so multicast is particularly amenable to pub sub style subscriptions where you have hundreds of thousands if not millions of subscribers. So you don't want to send a million copies of that message when you have a million subscribers. What you want to do is use multicast and have all the subscribers listening for the multicast uh, message. And then multicast is supported in the network hardware in such a way that the message is replicated out across the hardware once to all the subscribers rather than one copy for every subscriber. So uh, for, for broadcast applications, that's extremely important to be able to support multicast, and 0MQ supports that. Very good. Well, nice. Yeah, like I said, I really appreciate that. There's so many things out there that it's hard to investigate them all, so it's nice when someone finds the, the gems out there to bring them to life. I think that's something that um, sets Utah C++ programmers apart from some of the other C++ uh, you know video streams and channels and whatnot out there is that uh, I'm really interested in exploring the different application libraries that are out there to for us to use I mean we, we do have sessions where we talk about core C++ language features but I'm less interested in being a language lawyer than I'm interested in being an application programmer so we, we talk a lot about libraries in this group very good well thank you uh, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions? You can either use the chat or audio. Oh, and I'll just, uh, you were asking during your discussion too about the uh, the socket uh, binding. Uh, TCP does allow for you to specify it any so that you can bind once and have it uh, listen to all the interfaces of a device. Good. So I'm sure that works just fine there. Yeah, I think that when uh, in our service when it does this uh, star in the bind specification I'm pretty sure that translates to the any I'll bet you're right uh, okay if there's uh, no more questions then we will end it there thanks